Good evening and welcome once again to Insight Live where we always have interesting subjects and Inside Light Live is always about people who are doing something about something and tonight we're talking about mental health during COVID and if you're from the UK area uh, the big D day is Victory Day is June 21st and that's when you're supposed to come out of it and already people are suffering some anxiety like what's life going to be back when like when it's normal again well it's a good uh, a good evening uh, and welcome to insight live from me melanie yes normal i mean i could i don't think that you know people yes. talk about what yeah. getting back to normal yeah. is and, and also of course uh, we don't want to discuss whether that uh, that date will be uh, changed in any way because of things that are happening. But uh, we're very excited because we have Dr. Stephen Critchlow, who is a psychiatrist. He is has written a book called Mindful of the Light, and it's practical steps and spiritual hope for uh, sorry help. Yeah, no, it is hope for mental health. So that is practical help and spiritual hope for mental health, uh, Dr. Stephen Critchlow. So he will be joining us a little later in the program. And so you can get yourself ready with your um, questions, perhaps, and your comments. We are live and interactive tonight and looking forward to a really good conversation. I don't know how your lockdown has been, what your mental health situation has been like, what kind of uh, self-talk you've had to engage with, how your uh, your spiritual life might have suffered because of not being able to be with the body of Christ, being able to meet on Sundays. But this is what we're talking about, uh, mental health during COVID. So uh, looking forward to that uh, yeah. interview. Yeah. But Kurt, it, it, you have a couple of things to say. It's amazing. I do. You know, we can praise God with our, our heart and our emotions in a very positive way. But I think there's also a negative way. I think there's a lot of dark, weighty processes that we have to overcome in our search for God and in, 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 in the Christian life. And I was reading this psalm the other day, Psalm 88, and there's very, it's a very dark, depressing psalm. So you chose and, it for tonight? Well, I chose it tonight <laughs> just to, because we, we usually read things that we like, that, mm -hmm. that are good, that are, oh, praise God, this is wonderful. But we kind of skip the dark, the bad parts. But I think we have to understand both. And in Psalm 88, it starts out like this. I mean, it, it, it doesn't sound very encouraging. It says, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Now, that's a positive statement. Day and night, I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more. And Context? I think the, the positive thing is... Is this David writing this? No, no, no. Who no, is this writing? It's somebody else. This is Sons of Korah. Ah. Okay. For the musical director. See, people <laughs> miss this out. I mean, when is the last time you heard a modern Christian <laughs> song like this? You know, I am overwhelmed with troubles in my life. <laughs> you know, but this, this is what I like about the scriptures. It's so raw and it doesn't shy away from these human emotions. Like, you know, in Psalm 43, verse 5, it says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So we mm. see these tremendous kind of like mental, spiritual distress Mm. And these individuals just fighting with God. Wouldn't it be great if they could just take a pill? No. <laughs> if a modern psychiatrist could, you know, hey, you need a little bit of this. You need a little bit of this. You need the microdose a little bit and you can get rid of that. You're I not mean, suggesting that. You better correct this. No, I'm this. not suggesting Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, the Apostle Paul did say to Timothy, take a little wine yeah. for your stomach. So, <laughs> so, Kurt, I mean, for me, it's, it's really interesting. I think, you know, when you talk about grieving, when you're talking about being really real with a distressing situation, that is something that we have to actually be true to ourselves, true to our, our situation. But there's also when we emotionally engage and then, then there's the place 
place of actually reframing a situation like something really bad can happen like I my phone was stolen now I could it's so inconvenient and all my contacts and some songs that I wrote uh, you know I just did a little kind of voice note singing into it those are all gone and so I could really be catastrophic but then when I look in Syria and I see what's happening in Syria I go oh, that's nothing it's nothing. So I think reframing our disastrous situation is really important because if we go down that emotional kind of uh, kind of depressed mode and then we just, oh, everything's just so bad and we start talking to ourselves in a way that actually just get, we get deeper and deeper and deeper into a dark place. That's where if we reframe our situation, we look at it and we can compare it to, to something that actually brings a reality check. I think that's so important. Yeah. Then I would say that we're less likely to start having mental breakdowns and want needing medication to adjust our thinking. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me, so I love just the way you can look at the scripture and, you know, and, and say, well, the Lord is my, you know, my strength and my song. You know, I, I love that, being able to just I, read I love those. these. <laughs> Even every, every scripture I've just read right now, it, it's raw, but there's hope. Yeah. You know, it says, it's just like saying, hey, I'm wasting away, but God, I trust in you. Oh God, my soul just condemns me. No, I trust in you. And it's like they're, they're really fighting. They're mm. not just sanctimonious words. Remember, this was set to music. Like if you go to my country in the United States, we have blues. And there was another name for the blues. It was, so, it was called Songs Behind the Mule, Songs Behind the Donkey. That means songs where people are depressed, they, they're, they're oppressed, you know, they're, they're in slavery. And mm -hmm. you have to learn to sing the songs behind the mule, not in front of the <laughs> mule. Yeah. And, and I think the Psalms, this one that I just read, these two, Psalm 88 and 42, are songs or psalms behind the mule, not always in front So they're of not the mule. victory songs, <laughs> they are right. songs of suffering. Well, they're fighting, they're, and they're real. Be, yeah. Yeah. It, I think people have to know it's okay. So many people, we did a, a show once on Insight Live, Christians and Medication. Mm. So many people wrote in, no, if you're a born and Christian, you shouldn't be taking medication and this and that. And nobody really had a clear answer for when you feel like you're behind the mule, mm. but it's great to talk about it. Kurt, one of the things uh, that you would always preach about is, uh, it was that actually, you know, when you're going through something, you have to go up a, a hill or a mountain, that it is so much easier to do it with somebody else. Mm. But if, it's, if, it's, if you're doing it on your own, that it is such a labor and it is so hard and it takes much longer. And I think that the fact that we have each other as the body of Christ, I think that when we share our troubles, when we actually do family together and, you know, one is helping lift another one, I think that's when we actually find ourselves, um, yeah. you know, doing so much better in our mental health. Yeah. Like if, if you phone somebody and you say, look, I'm feeling this way, can you pray for me? It's amazing. Or if you're feeling down, you pray some to you pray. Uh, sorry, you phone somebody else and you lift them up. Then it's like, oh, I feel so much yeah. better already. So there are things that when we actually use our our giftings and we socialize in whether it's on the phone or whatever the case, is, it's like a whole different thing. Well, I'm putting myself. Say, for example, I'm 75. I'm in a home. Um, you know, I, haven't, I, I don't have the money or to see a psychiatrist, for example, my father's a psychiatrist, and my church doesn't really believe in medication or depression, and who do I reach out to? So who, for example, in my country, who can you turn to if you're struggling with mental health issues without paying a, a fortune, I should add, or many times when we go to our social services, people don't have time for us. So this next video right here is an organization, it's a nonprofit organization that is taking up the COVID-19 mental health challenge and it's just great to, to expose it to you uh, right now so you can see what other people are doing and then we're going to come back to Dr. Critchlow and what he is doing in the UK. Thanks. Well, one of the fallouts from the pandemic, growing numbers of Americans struggling with their mental and emotional health. A July report from the Kaiser Family Foundation found that one in three adults reporting symptoms 
of anxiety or depressive disorder, and that is up from roughly 1 in 10 in 2019. Also, more than half have reported that stress over the virus has negatively affected their health. Grace Alliance is a faith-based organization offering tools and resources to people for their mental and emotional health, and founder Joe Padilla joins us now to talk about how Grace has adapted to the pandemic. Joe, thanks for joining us. You have been offering small groups connected with churches intended for those struggling, um, as well as their families, and now you're offering Thrive, which is really something anyone can tap into. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, we actually, Thrive has been around for quite a while. We actually started the organization using Thrive as a, a way of coaching people. Um, but what really took off for, for us was our groups, which we call Grace Groups. Now, Thrive, what we do is kind of our personal wellness track. What we do is a whole health approach to help somebody regain their life mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and all the relationships are all tied within that. So what we're doing is that we kind of break down what are these aspects of that really help us build mental and emotional resilience and, and using the science and using the faith and putting it all together to help people through that practical journey <clears throat> yeah, and it's so uh, needed right now, of course. We've just talked about the latest numbers from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, what are you seeing from your vantage point? Are you seeing more people seeking out help, um, expressing that they are going through a tough time? Yeah, you know, all the numbers that you see, that there, there are just so much going on. As far, obviously, the, the Kaiser Fa Family Foundation, um, they have actually one report where they're, they're, they have a tracking poll, you know, uh, showing that there's a negative mental health impact happening. Back in March, it was 30 percent. Now in August, they're saying it's at 53 percent of, the, the, of those who are polling. CDC is reporting up to 40 percent of the uh, population is suffering from some sort of mental health and even substance abuse. And what we're seeing with people that are that are reaching out, that sometimes they go to the church, but they can't find that message or that support within the church. So they're actually looking at different resources. And we just happen to be one of those resources that are helping them really navigate this topic with practical tools and insights. How do you deal with this? How do you uh, uh, walk through this whole experience with the right, with the right resources? All right, and tell us a little bit about the power of these groups. What is it about coming together with other people that helps people navigate their own journey? Well, the, the, the whole essence about these groups that we do, um, it, when you look at the research on mental health and mental health recovery, what you'll find is that the common denominator in all of recovery is community. And so really having a community that knows how to talk about it in such a safe way and then also a community that has tools to really practically get through. Because there's a lot of groups that, that even in our, my, our experience coming through this uh, um, ourselves, there was a lot of venting cut types of groups. So when you look at the research, those groups aren't very effective. But when you give a group a topic and a, and a tool, that group has a self-discovery and an experiential learning process to actually see results and get better. And that's what we've done with our groups. And we really provide a topic and some tools to really help people get through this, not only as an individual, but also as families and marriages. And we've done research on the groups and we were showing that these groups actually are reducing symptoms and increasing and renewing faith. Well, I know a lot of people are looking for a resource like this right now. Joe Padilla with the Grace Alliance. Thanks for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, those statistics are very similar to the UK and mm. they're horrendous. I mean, I, I think the UK was even worse uh, with, with teenagers, yes. Melanie. But the, the thing that pains me is very often the church has no experience in this. Mm. I mean, our daughter is in California and I, I think her pastor did a series on anxiety and that just attracted people. Mm. People came because it was so practical. I mean, anxiety, what, what can you call it? An abuse of the imagination is what anxiety is. You're abusing your imagination. And the pastor was, was talking on that. But apart from that, uh, where do people go? Where do Christian people go? And so mm -hmm. that's just one, he said, of many organizations. But mm -hmm. it's not many organizations. Yeah. It's one of a few organizations that's uh, doing that. I think Rick Warren was the last one, I think eight years ago, he had a, a symposium where he brought together psychologists and psychiatrists, mental health, um, experts because his uh, son committed, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was probably the first time that I saw the church take mental health so seriously. Mm. <clears throat> but now the statistics are just, they're out of, they're wild. Mm.
Yeah. But I do think that you know, if, if we mm. know somebody who is is struggling with that, just being able to be a friend to them, to reach out, to maybe in, help them to find some help um, is, is a good thing. And obviously praying together and expecting the Holy Spirit to move. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, it, it's just, I think it's every person is an individual and, and how they respond is, yeah. uh, you know, we have to be um, sensitive. Mm -hmm. So just in a few minutes, we're gonna meet uh, Dr. Stephen Critchlow live, but I found a video of his on, on YouTube and it's such a good introduction, so I, I edited it a little bit, but it's just a brilliant video to see where his heart is at. My name is Dr. Stephen Critchlow. Um, I was a consultant psychiatrist in Northern Ireland for several years. I've also been a church planter and church leader in different parts of the world, including Galway, Cyprus and London. In this seminar, I'm talking about the Christian and depression. Of course, the Bible is full of people who not only rejoiced in their salvation, but also at times got pretty depressed. People like Elijah, Job, Jeremiah and David. In Christian history as well, many people have struggled with depression like Hudson Taylor and Spurgeon and others. In this session, I'll be talking about depression. What is it and what causes it? Many people struggle with depression, but find it difficult to talk about because sometimes the church doesn't deal well with it. We'll be looking as well at what, uh, how we can help a person with depression. We'll also be looking at um, briefly at its treatment and trying to help those who struggle with it. They may be our friends or our relatives or others that we know of. And so this session I think will be beneficial for everybody uh, because depression is a very common condition and I'm hopeful that you'll come and find benefit from it. Now, I showed that video because, I mean, he could be out playing golf in the coast of El Sol, mm. where we are, I don't play golf, but he's decided to do something about this. And I like how he's been a church planter as yes. well. And then what he told me, Melanie, five daughters and eight grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was and six, even six even and the two. grandchildren outnumber. I think there's six girls to two boys. Yeah. So I, I wonder what's happening, and I really look forward to meeting. And it's over to you, Stephen, right now. Thanks for being on air with us. Stephen, we want to thank you so much for coming on uh, Insight Live. And uh, just welcome you on behalf of all our viewers, Revelation TV, those that are watching now live, and also those who might uh, watch on Catch Up. So thank you so much for taking your time uh, to be here with us. Yeah. And, and just let him the, talk, let me say. <laughs> you can say hi to the viewers if you want, like, Stephen. Hello, lovely to see you all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he has a good wave. <laughs> yeah, he has a very good wave, a good <laughs> smile too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, Stephen, an obvious question is, you know, I've been a Christian for, for a while and I've noticed that so many fellow Christians have a bias towards psychiatrists. When I tell them my dad is a psychiatrist, they roll their eyes or some people say, well, can you get me a, a prescription right away? But, um, you know, how do you, as a Christian, um, merge being a psychiatrist with your faith? And what have you been spending your life helping? What type of people? Well, I think, first of all, it, it's useful to consider, you know, the, the fact that there has often been an antipathy between psychiatrists and Christian leaders. And I think that's, that's partly because... You know, uh, someone like Freud thought that basically uh, the Christian faith or God was an illusion. It was a, a device of the unconscious. And of course, st if you start at that point in time, then, you know, you're not on a good track for belief. <laughs> um, but, but, but on the other hand, I think um, Christian leaders have sometimes made huge mistakes because they've often kind of said such things as or, or, or thought such things at all. Christian, uh, all mental health problems are somehow related to uh, the demonic or, or something like that. Or you must have got something wrong in your spiritual life. And the problem there, of course, is that not only then is the person depressed, but they feel guilty as well because I must be a failure. 
and therefore they get worse and worse and probably stop attending church. But I love the fact that in the scriptures, for example, we have lovely accounts of, of people like Job who basically lost everything and, and at one point wanted to die and wish he'd never been born. And, and there's an example of somebody who loses everything and can't understand it. And, and you know, I think that we are called um, as psychiatrists to be compassionate. Uh, and I think compassion involves being sensitive to somebody's need and doing something about it. But supremely as Christian psychiatrists, and there are quite a few of us here in Northern Ireland, for example, I think we have that role to be compassionate, caring, and understanding of people so they get the very best of the scriptures and also the very best of mental health. Okay. So when you were at the height of your, your work, what was a typical day for you? What would you come across? <laughs> well, you see, I, I'm an old age psychiatrist or psychiatrist for the elderly. So I have been full time consultant um, in, 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 in Northern Ireland. And so I would be coming across a lot of people with depression, with paranoid states, and obviously also dealing a lot with, with dementia as well. And, and obviously in that I'd be dealing a lot with with um, kind of uh, relatives as well, advising them and helping them to, to, to know what's the best way forward uh, for this individual. And, and obviously I'm now part-time, uh, I'm doing liaison psychiatry, which means going on to the wards and, and advising uh, medical and surgical teams and others on the treatment of patients with mental health yeah. conditions. Oh, you know, one question I, I really wanna ask you since you've been a church planter, if you were to plant a church right now in Northern Ireland, and you, know, and you know full well the onslaught of mental health, how would, what would you do different in terms, how would you set up a good mental health program that people would be drawn to your church? I think there are, there are uh, presently some programs that really try and engage people with mental health and often it's not one church can do it by themselves, but it's often a number of churches clubbing together. For example, having some kind of resource center uh, where people with mental health problems can come for a drop in, they can come for a cup of tea, they can find help signing forms and getting their benefits sorted, and it can be a friendly atmosphere. And then not maybe trying to have a full blown church service, but rather, you know, a level of interaction, maybe some singing together, a simple message, and, and engaging them in it and with it. And I think some people have done that. I mean, I was talking to a Salvation Army person not long ago, and they were saying, yes, that's the kind of thing we're involved in. And I think churches could do that a lot more, but sometimes one church by itself can't do it. It needs a combination, a combined approach. Yeah, wow, that is excellent. I love your answer. That is absolutely spot on for me. I just think that's marvellous. One of our viewers who uh, wrote in right now, uh, Stephen has uh, a question for you. Uh, this is um, Chandra Kumar Sukumaran. I always get your name wrong, but anyway. It says, Kurt Melly, repetitions of thoughts of a trauma an individual gone through as a child to adult will make the mind unstable. Uh, the spirit, soul and body will not work in harmony. Ask Dr. Stephen Critchlow. And then he says, hi, good Melanie. Are you uh, ready again to be supernaturally charged for cross-examination? So this particular viewer is wonderful in just asking us things. So he says, a chronic anxiety, stress and worry are considered by the medical profession to be the number one cause heart attack, strokes, and all other conditions related to the heart and blood vessels. The main cause of anxiety, stress, and worry is the spirit of fear. The solution to this is for the triune God, Holy Ghost, come inside you and take it uh, away uh, with supernatural power of the triune God, Jesus Christ. Do you agree, Dr. Stephen? You have to be truly born again without deceiving God. I love Insight Live on Revelation TV. God bless Revelation TV all around the world. Wow. Well, Stephen, That's did a... you kind of get the gist of that? Mm. Well, 
It sounds to me from that I've got to answer about half a dozen things all in one sentence. So, so let, <laughs> let, let's take two. I'll do my best to go through it. Yeah, so let's, let's take, take two. the two. Let's take the, the trauma, thoughts of trauma. Okay, An individual yeah. who's gone through as a child to adult will make um, uh, the mind unstable. Let's just unstable. take that one. Well, let, um, let, me take the, let me take the trauma aspect because, yes. you know, um, there is a condition called post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, which is a serious condition and not uncommon. And it is going to be much more common uh, as a result of the COVID crisis because people have been in intensive care and they will found that experience extremely difficult. For example, some people have had the experience of feeling that people in intensive care are trying to murder them because, of course, you're there and you're very vulnerable and you're maybe a bit delirious. And then six people all with their masks on and their gowns on descend on you. And you can imagine, you know, uh, in that state, they're, they're trying to murder me or they're trying to do something terrible to me. So they come out of that intensive care with trauma and they have a post-traumatic stress reaction to a near-death experience. Wow. And of course, that is most uncomfortable and most difficult. And, and it usually needs skilled help to get through that because we might say from a Christian point of view, oh, come to the church, you know, everything's going to be okay. But unfortunately, that's not sufficient. You need to be able to help that person in a way to reintegrate uh, that experience to to work with it, to re-experience it with a view to resolving it. Mm. And that is done in skilled ways. And, you know, we need the church, yes, but we need other skills as well. Yes. And those other skills are going to be part and parcel of uh, promoting good recovery. Mm. So that's a little bit on the trauma aspect. Now, what else do you want me to answer? So I just wanted to comment on the trauma aspect. Uh, you know, when we went, before we started uh, live, um, Stephen, uh, we were talking about human-given psychotherapy, and one of the, the things that they do to release people from trauma is using a process called Rewind, where they literally unlock the emotional aspect of the amygdala so that there's no triggering. And, and it's actually quite phenomenal. I've sat under that training myself, and it's very, very successful. It's very, I mean, yeah. I've seen, uh, you know, people who've been in war and, you know, have all that kind of, uh, you know, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder concerning that. So I think yes. these days that really, I think God has given wisdom and insight into some of the, you know, new techniques. So uh, yes. there is not, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, I just have to live with it, you know, because the prayer hasn't worked. But as you said, it requires a skillful uh, person who, who has knowledge of this. But, but let's, let's, let's just slow down yes. with that single question because so many of our viewers have suffered abuse. Child abuse, you know, perhaps, child abuse. yes. So many, oh. and they, ha they have those repetitive thoughts because yes. you know, we know yeah. our viewers pretty mm. well because so many of you have written in of those repetitive thoughts that even though you're 65 years old you or 70 oh. or 80, you cannot. H how would you generally how would you, you're a psychiatrist, you're not a psychologist, you prescribe medication, and, and we've had very few psychiatrists on, on, our, on our program. Yeah. How would you treat someone like that who has that post-traumatic well, stress yes, disorder? I, mean, I would say, to be honest, that, that because the area is quite specialized, I actually myself would not necessarily treat a person like that. I would more advise where to go to get the very best treatment. Mm. And, and, you know, there are a number of techniques that are valuable. For example, one of them is called uh, eye movement desensitization reprogramming. Yes, uh, I, I, yes I know that. Yeah. At EMDR, but works extremely well. And is a way of, in a sense, distracting the person to allow them to be able to reconnect with their emotional damage with a sense of working it through in the therapy sessions. And that is very valuable. Mm. Another one is, is called trauma-based cognitive behavior therapy, again, which works extremely well. And what you've mentioned, I'm not familiar with uh, this other technique, but obviously unlocking the emotions and it being able to reintegrate that very painful experience into uh, one's life, I think is, is key. And as, as you rightly say, people have these dreams, these flashbacks, uh, they sometimes uh, find it very difficult to visit a site of previous trauma. Uh, they sometimes have other features, and they stay there and they're not resolved. 
and a really good therapist. I, I've been, work, been working quite closely with one, although I'm not a therapist in that area. That can be so helpful in getting the problem sorted. Mm. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just to, um, to, to the, his second question, well, the one that I'm going to uh, pinpoint, is he's talking about anxiety, stress and worry, and he says this is a spirit of fear. And, and he obviously he says the solution is the triune God <clears throat> and the supernatural power of Jesus. Would you, would you say that the spirit of fear, uh, you know, the whole thing with anxiety and stress and worry, would you say that's linked to a spirit of fear in your, uh, you know, your experience? I think the reality is that, that some people do suffer from anxiety more than others. And, and some, in some families, anxiety is particularly prominent. Uh, other people get anxious in particular situations uh, and, and that causes them anxiety. And obviously anxiety is related to a number of other kind of mental health disorders. I mean, it's common in uh, obsessional disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, it's common in panic disorders, uh, it's common in phobias. All of those are anxiety related. So anxiety is obviously one of those key subjects that, that we as psychiatrists deal with. I'm not particularly happy with calling it a spirit of anxiety, to be honest. I think one is better to, to face the anxiety and find ways to work through it. And I think those ways through it are both um, uh, psychological, psychiatric, if you like, and spiritual. Mm. I think it's one of those conditions where there's a very useful fusion uh, of of different things from different sources. So, for example, you know, in anxiety, we, we all know that breathing techniques and relaxation techniques are very, very valuable because the breathing techniques reset the blood chemistry, and that can really be very helpful if they're done properly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, likewise, uh, learning relaxation techniques, um, learning uh, a certain amount of time management skills, all these kinds of things can build in to helping somebody deal with their anxiety. Mm. And sometimes, of course, medication can be necessary as well. Mm. On top of that, however, one would immediately bring in the spiritual and say that, you know, um, the beautiful psalm, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, the psalm of David, is a beautiful psalm to recite to oneself when one's going through stress because you mm. say, the Lord is with me, the mm. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, you know. Uh, likewise, Jesus said, you know, be anxious, don't be anxious. Mm. Uh, and that comes through so many times. And, and certainly I have found in my own experience because all of us get anxious at times and I possibly suffer from anxiety more than some. But I will find that as I walk along each day and an anxious thought comes to mind, yes, I will try and work it out, maybe write it down and work out what I should do about it. But sometimes I will just pray out, Jesus, 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 mm. because it's an acknowledgement that the Lord is with me, that he cares for me and I can cast all my burdens upon him and throw them on the Lord. So I'm not sure I would necessarily go along with the spirit of anxiety, but this is one of those conditions where both the psychological and the spiritual do come together, mm, I believe. Absolutely. Well, we have Norma, who's written in, and she says, One psych psychiatrist I knew once told a young woman that her brother's alcohol alcoholism was nothing to do with her and it shouldn't bother her. Not very helpful for the young woman. This was in the 70s and apparently there was no AA for relatives at that time. Or was it called Alan? Was it called uh, Alanon? Uh, I yeah. think it's Alanon. Yeah. I hope things have changed now. Well, Norma, yes, that's good news. Um, what, what, about, what about that stress when you've got a family member who is trying to deal with something, maybe it's a physical thing or an addiction, or perhaps um, they are not, they're just about to lose their job because they can't get there on time. What about the family member who's suffering from that kind of you know, stress and anxiety because of some circumstances around them? What would you advise, uh, Dr. Stephen? Oh. Well, obviously that situation is, is not easy. And, and one would want to uh, not necessarily give immediate advice to an individual situation. However, you know, I think that carers 
of those with mental health conditions, and of course, I'm more familiar with carers for those with suffering from dementia, you in a sense have to be able to set um, certain limits, if you can, as to what you can and cannot do. And sometimes relatives will take on far too much mm. for themselves. They will begin to think, I've got to do everything here. And I think sometimes in different conditions, it is a uh, you need to pull in other resources. So if it's dealing with alcoholism, you might need to try and make sure you're engaged with the AA or Al-Anon or some of these other services. You might need to somehow, uh, you may need to bring in other help from other sources or, or maybe share a load as the family and, and have certain limits as to what you will do and certain things you cannot do. Because if you run yourself into the ground, that doesn't actually do anybody any good in the, in, in the long run. And similarly with, with dealing with dementia, we often have to advise carers, you may sometimes need a break, you may sometimes need some time out, you may sometimes need others to come and help you. So trying to do everything oneself is not usually a good idea. Mm, that is such excellent advice. I mean, I, I see people and I try and advise people who are, you know, facing a situation where their parents are, or one parent now is starting to get dementia. And I remember what, uh, uh, my two sisters and I, we went to go and see my dad's uh, doctor and the, he just had the greatest advice. He said, what I want to tell you is that you are watching your father slowly die. And so it is a long sense of grieving. And so for us, it was so wonderful to be able to frame it in a way that we could understand what was happening, the aggression and the process of, you know, losing somebody, you know, and then, I mean, he nearly actually killed me uh, one time I took him out and he nearly um, he put his his walking stick in front of me on purpose and tried to trip me into the traffic and it's like so how do you do all that and I knew that he that wasn't him that was not my dad my dad loved me so uh, you yeah. know there's different ways of framing this so I really appreciate uh, especially those who are looking after people what you said uh, is absolutely yeah. and I hope people will take that on that you cannot do everything you have to share the load and you need to take time to take a deep breath for yourself and and actually for our viewers who are you know caring for a spouse who's in a wheelchair or dementia please take this on dr stephen has just said the most valuable thing that can actually save your mental health and your physical yeah. health as well so thank you for that kurt you have another uh, question perhaps yeah I, I do you know i'm just interacting with you uh stephen on on the bible and so many people say it's just through prayer it's just through prayer and i was thinking hold on the apostle paul said rejoice always pray continually give thanks in every circumstance for that's god's will for you in christ jesus and why do somehow we emphasize the importance of prayer, but we forget about the, the rejoicing, we forget about giving the thanks, and we forget about the hard work of renewing your mind, especially if you come out of a traumatic background like I did, adopted, mother tried to abort me, the whole story, and you have to overcome that. And then I was just reading this verse in Philippians 4, where Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Then he says this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Now, for me, I do this breathing. If I sense, if I'm anxious, I'll take a deep abdominal breath like the US Marines do, by the way, when they're in battle. And I say a little prayer, and then I just start thinking of good things, and that anxiety disappears. But it wasn't always like that. My dad being a psychiatrist, when I was nine years old, I had to be sent away because I was violent. I was certainly not thankful. I was a disturbed kid. I've been to psychiatrists all my life. I've been on medication. All, well, not all my life, not since I've been a Christian, praise God, but as a young man. But literally right now, you've talked about techniques. And, but this is a command where the Bible commands us to renew our mind, to think about things. So what are some personal practices that, that help you in, in your walk personally? Because you said you suffer from anxiety. Well, yes, I mean, we all put into practice certain things. And I, I, I'm, my anxiety is not, not, not so bad. I mean, I do get anxious a bit at times. 
uh, I find sometimes writing things down and working them through and knowing what to do about situations can be very valuable. I don't often need to use the breathing techniques myself, fortunately, but I do find I love educating people on mental health conditions because I like people to understand as much as they can about mental health conditions because I think that helps them to care. And so uh, in a lecture format, I might ask people to breathe in and out as fast as they can for 30 seconds and then show them that they're feeling anxious and tremulous and faint and then <laughs> ask them to breathe in and out slowly, breathe in to the count of four and breathe out to the count of seven and, you know, and slow them right down and they say, say, I feel relaxed and sleepy. And I tell them, don't go to sleep my lecture, I'm still talking. <laughs> you know? but basically, you know, the, the relaxation techniques like that can be very valuable. But also you're, you're right in, in suggesting that we renew our minds because renewing our minds is very important and thinking about the right kinds of things. And, and I find that my wife is a very good cognitive behavior therapist because she will say to me, Steve, why are you thinking that way? You're not thinking logically. That is not correct. And, you know, we all find that when we're maybe feeling a little bit down, we might think of, you know, somebody didn't greet me in church probably today. They don't like me, this kind of thing. And you can easily go along that track. Uh, whereas my wife will slow me down a bit and say, I'm not really sure that that was correct. And I say, yes, you're probably right on reflection. So, um, I just, uh, your, your wife sounds wonderful, by the way. I, I would like to meet her. <laughs> um, just to um, interact with our viewers, um, and we have uh, June. She is a wonderful um, interactive viewer, and she has suffered a lot in her life, Stephen. So I uh, just want to read what she said, and perhaps you can make some comments after. She says, mm -hmm. uh, no more lockdown was her um, title. And she says, hello, folks. I've explained to you before that I had a brutal upbringing um, due to being born female. I lived with it uh, mainly out of my knowing till I approached menopause years when I became deeply depressed. After being abused by church leaders who told me, among other things, it was, was because I wasn't in submission to my husband who was seeing someone else. Uh, and that's in, in, in brackets. And that was why I was depressed. I gave up on the church uh, to, for help. I found counseling helped me understand why I was the way I was, but it was Jesus who changed me. I'm not completely healed, but the difference in me is amazing. Uh, I trained as a BACP counselor, but am retired now. Self-awareness and determination were the main ways I came uh, to change. My hope is in Jesus who will never leave me or forsake me. And that's, that's uh, June. Um, would you like to comment to any of that? And I know as a child, I'm not quite sure whether, um, you know, I remember well, but I think there was, um, you know, quite a bit of abuse and some things going on. Um, any comments in her process? Because obviously we're talking about Jesus coming in and dramatically doing something uh, as well as obviously um, getting help. Well, I think one of the things that comes across so strongly as we meditate on the person of Christ himself is how often he was moved with compassion mm. and he was moved with compassion to touch a leper who nobody else would touch. He was moved with compassion to teach the crowds. He was moved with compassion to, to give out food to 5,000 people. He was moved with compassion all kinds of ways. And I think that the, the church is not always as compassionate as it should be. It, and I think that we need to, in a sense, particularly with people with mental health struggles, to come alongside them. And, you know, uh, uh, although maybe it's not possible in the COVID crisis, a hand on the shoulder, a sense of being with them before we necessarily start talking to them. And I think that sense of them knowing that we be, are with them, that we love them, that we care about them, is, is of primary importance. After that, we may have one or two things to say, but we want to pray that we say things in a way that will be helpful, and we don't necessarily need to give all of God's truth all at once. <laughs> we want to identify with people and try and support them along the way, and that's the way we hope we should be. Mm, excellent, excellent. Uh, Alice from Scotland has written in, and she says, Melanie, you are so spot on about retuning your inner voice and looking across at Syria. So, Stephen, what I 
I think before you came on, I was talking about that actually reframing, like I, my phone had been stolen and I could have just really catastrophized that because I lost some, inf you know, some important information. But then I just looked at what's happening in Syria and I reframed it and said, you know, it's really not that important, it's inconvenient. And so she writes this and then she also says, enjoying Kurt's shirt, which makes, makes me think of the ocean and sea life. Can't imagine how uplifting, uh, you can't imagine how uplifting you both are with your positive vibes and deep understanding. Thank you so much. And that's Alice uh, from Scotland. Um, so just on the back of Alice's um, of email, I'd like to kind of move our questioning to perhaps when somebody needs to go on to antidepressants. Um, you know, a lot of people that I see in counselling and also because I'm doing these um, psychotherapy studies, what we move towards is obviously to, yes, if you have to go on antidepressants, that would be something that would help you for a time. But then obviously we're looking to making sure that when, it, when, when it's the right time, we can slowly bring you off them. So what are your comments on that? Because I'm sure there's some viewers that would like to hear your opinion. Well, first of all, you know, um, if you've been to see a doctor and the doctor has recommended an antidepressant, then, then that can be very helpful to you because it is, in a sense, taking the psychiatric, the psychological, as well as the spiritual. And, and the psychiatric would say, yes, you know, in this situation, there's a true depression. And of course, we, we as psychiatrists diagnose depression carefully. And I don't have time to go into necessarily how we exactly diagnose it just at the moment, but we diagnose it carefully. And we feel that in that situation, an antidepressant is going to be necessary. And we usually tell somebody, look, this is going to be helpful to you, uh, we believe. And, you know, it might be a week or two before you get the beginnings of that benefit. And we'll say to you, you want to stay on it until your depression is better. And then at least for a further period of time, six months or a year, to make sure the depression uh, doesn't come back. And sometimes when somebody's had periodic severe depression, we may leave somebody on, on the for longer term. And, and they're not addictive, although some people can get a bit of a withdrawal reaction. And they usually are beneficial. They don't benefit to everybody. And sometimes you have to use one or two together, sometimes one or two different types. You may have to go through other medications as well. But usually they're very helpful. And I believe that you know, that is a very good way forward. Mm. And there are other ways of treating depression as well. And we, we say, yes, that can be uh, very beneficial. But one of the other things I just want to add in just here briefly before I, um, while I get the chance to say it, is that, you know, there's been some very good work to show that basically those who regularly practice a religious faith do much better than those who don't, you know. <laughs> Uh, one of my colleagues, Patricia Casey, Professor Patricia Casey from Dublin, has an excellent paper on the psychosocial benefits of religious practice. And she says that those who basically regularly practice a religious faith have less depression, less suicide, they live longer, their marriages hold together better, they cope better with bereavement, which of course is very important in this COVID crisis. And, and, and also young people do better in terms of less drugs, alcohol and other problems. So basically, I, I think that's the coming together. The religious practice is very important and it ties in with things like antidepressants and everything else, which is also very valuable. Wow. I, I, I love that comment. I mean, that's it, just coming from you is absolutely wonderful. We do have one. Um, one uh, of our um, viewers here, this is Leslie, and she's wanting to ask uh, your opinion. Hi, folks. Does the doctor believe that some people, small minority, may be demon-possessed? And that's from Leslie. She's asking you, Stephen, whether you believe people can be demon-possessed. Well, the answer to that is yes, the demonic is real. Um, and, and the difficulty people have is is associating the demonic sometimes with mental health conditions. Mm. Uh, certainly in the demonic, I haven't been widely involved in this, but you know, there have been one or two instances where somebody's been holding their hands over their ears because they can't bear to hear the name of Jesus and writhing around on the floor. And then the demons are cast out and they're at peace again. But that is rather different from the run-of-the-mill uh, mental health conditions. And, 
And, you know, that's the demonic. And you, you see that obviously in the ministry of Christ, and it still exists. Mm. However, I think that most mental health conditions that I've come across are quite different from that. Yes. And one of my experiences was in, in uh, Moldova, which I often visit, and somebody came to me about a person in the congregation who essentially everybody had been trying to cast demons out of him. And he wasn't going to go to back, back to that church, thanks very much, because he had, he had a schizophrenic illness. But, you know, he was so fed up of people trying to do this on him that he, he was repelled by it. Of course, that's the, that's the opposite of that. And so although the demonic is real, uh, and, and I've had some experience of that, we need to recognize that mental health is also uh, real. And, and the two, I think, might cross at times, but perhaps not very often. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, that's a great comment. Can I just, uh, yes. uh, so we have Maggie here. She says, this is about lockdown, lockdown. She says, hi, folks. Interesting show tonight. I have loved the lockdown because it meant that I was not interrupt, uh, interrupted while painting. My friends dropped in for coffee. I have not been able to voice how I felt because so many people have suffered badly during lockdown. I don't look forward to lockdown lifting. Does this mean there is something wrong with me? I do like people. And that's Maggie. Perhaps uh, you can uh, humor her, uh, uh, Stephen, and comment. The thing about lockdown is it's been very much worse for some people, particularly those with chronic physical conditions and chronic mental health conditions. It's also been particularly bad for the 18 to 24 year old age group who've really struggled with relationships, with edu loss of education, loss of job opportunities, with an increase of suicidal thoughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some people have been extremely lonely. And one of the other problems people have had is the, the fact that they've not been able to to show grief properly. They've not been able to be with somebody when they've died, and, and that has been tragic and very difficult. Mm. And of course, if you're in, a, in a, an elderly person's home, uh, you know, uh, you're locked away, you've not been able to get visitors, that has also been tragic. However, you know, there are a few incidents where individuals have quite enjoyed it because they just get on with what, what they want to do. Yeah. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely fine. That's great. Quite, Stephen, we um, have to um, interrupt um, you now because we want to uh, be able to tell our viewers where they can get your book as well. Yeah, and yeah. the title of the book is Mindful of the Light, and it's Practical Help and Spiritual Hope for Mental Health, and it sounds like it's a great book for, for COVID. And uh, tell us where we can get your book. Yeah, well, it's on Amazon. Uh, that's probably the best way to go through to it. Uh, you know, so get it from Amazon. Some bookshops may have it as well. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, we, we want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stephen Critchlow. Is that how you pronounce Critchlow. it? Critchlow. <laughs> Critchlow. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stephen Critchlow. Uh, we want to thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, you well, can thank see. You guys, and thank you, Melanie. Yeah, you can see by the interactions that people really felt comfortable with you. So thank you so much. You were just so relaxed, and such salient, um, you know, advice and and, and perspectives. So we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. God bless you, and uh, thank God you bless. so much. Okay, thank, thank you, Stephen. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Wow, what a fantastic I know. interview. Oh, I just you know? loved and, him. And the questions, and yes. uh, I remember my the first time I we saw a Christian some, yeah. psychiatrist, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the whole church was enthralled by what we learned. Oh. Well, that was a, just a great interview. Really enjoyed that. So you can you can share this with your friends as well. Just uh, a couple of you have still written in. We've got a few more minutes to, to read this. Hi, Mel. It's nice to see you. And your husband again. My family have hated me since I got saved in 2002. They say to me plainly they hate uh, their hate for Jesus. My gran was saved when she, uh, but she's dead. And it's just difficult for talking to my family. And I'm around... Uh, surrounded in a rough estate that hate Jesus. Please, if you can, pray. Say a little prayer. Give me the confidence to go out this summer, please. Love, Dylan. Dylan, we just bless you and we speak boldness and love over you and protection over you right now. How many seconds? Oh, we got to go. seconds. Okay, so who else have we got here? Um, I love Jesus uh, and he changes life. Uh, we, we don't have time to read all that. We've got a few more, and I'm sorry we didn't get to them. Thank you. I will read them straight after. But we bless you. Thanks for being with us this evening on Insight Live, where we've had an interesting talk with a psychiatrist, Dr. Stephen Critchlow. So bless you. Kurt, you can say goodbye. Well, goodbye, and we will see you next week with another interesting topic. I won't tell you what it is.
and uh, thank you so much for your participation and, and writing in it. This really makes this, this program bless you, we love you, and we will see you next week. So keep praying for those of, uh, you know, just sensitivity to those who have mental illness around you, and we bless you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Bye.